She was stabbed 30 times. It was a very violent, bloody crime scene. She didn't do anything to anybody. She didn't deserve to die. I've been prosecuting murderers for 15 years, and I've never lost a homicide case. He never saw a more evil look than he saw in the eyes of Kenneth Waters. My job is to fight for justice. I've been defending the accused for over 20 years. This is as bad a frame job or stitch up as you'll find. Here, Kenny, Kenny, Kenny Waters. Ensuring the innocent don't serve time for someone else's crime. He confessed to them that he did it. I mean, it all can't be wrong. For true justice to be served, we need to answer one single question. Nestled in the historic Neshoba Valley, tight-knit Ayer, Massachusetts, is a short 35 miles drive northeast of Boston, but a world away from sharing the big city problems. So Eugenie Eborn thought. Katerina! Katerina, hi! Until a visit to her mother-in-law, Katerina Brow's house, destroys that notion forever. My sister-in-law is a nurse, so if anybody had to find my mom... Katerina! I mean, she was probably the person. Oh, Katerina! Within minutes, the scene is crawling with police officers. She was stabbed uh, 30 times, and it was a very violent, bloody crime scene. They did find a knife, and there was a lamp that had been used to murder her also. And there was no obvious evidence of a forced break-in, which of course could mean that she recognized the person that she let in. Mom! Mom! It's a total shock. It's really, you know, my heart was just, just ripped, ripped out from that point on. Um, she didn't do anything to anybody. So who in this small town could be so cruel as to kill the 48-year-old, hard-working mother of two? And why? There was the jewelry, there was the money that was hidden in a couple different places in the house. $1,800 generally was a big take in, in air at that time. But if the motive is money, why were there so many stab wounds? There was some real hatred, or almost rage from the perpetrator incomprehensible to think that someone could do something like that to someone over what money revenge the savagery of this attack says this crime was driven by rage not money and that means it can be the work of two types of perpetrators someone who knows the victim or someone who has attacked before this makes one of investigators first task simple track down anyone in the area with a violent past and ask, can a connection be made? Well, one neighborhood suspect was named Kenneth Waters. He, he lived uh, very close by. They lived behind us through some woods. We always knew them as a family that um, just was uh, sort of like a, a troubled family. You know, drug issues, alcohol issues, that type of thing. Well, Kenny was a knock-around guy, as they would say. I mean, they grew up in a poor family, and, you know, he was getting arrested for petty theft. It's not just small-time thieving that puts Kenny on the cop's radar. When it comes to using a blade, he's major league. He had threatened a police officer and tried to assault him with a machete. 
And there's more. <laughs> He's recently been released from jail for slashing a man's throat in a bar fight. Kenny Waters' victim said that when he was being stabbed and brutalized by Kenneth Waters, he looked into his eyes and he never saw a more evil look than he saw in the eyes of Kenneth Waters. Hey, Brenda, we got visitors. The day after Katarina's ah, murder, Taylor, investigators pull him in for questioning. Oh, come on! Their first question, where was he when Katarina was killed? Where were you between 7, 10 a.m. and 10, 45 a.m.? I was at work. Kenny claims he was working at a local diner and has the time card to prove it. Time cards are evidence, a documentary evidence, that he worked that day in question. And he said his card was there showing that, that he was working at that time when he said he was. They dispatched a police officer to go to talk to the people in the diner. Right that day, they went and asked them and confirmed his alibi. Water's record earned him a place on the short list of suspects. He's known to be violent, he's quick to pull a knife, and he practically lives next door. I've got no problem with that. His records earned him a once-over. Eliminating suspects is the name of the game. But Kenny's time card at the diner shows he couldn't have been the killer. Next, police turn to the family. How solid is the marriage between Katerina and her husband, Charles? Could he be the culprit? In a homicide like that, and especially one with the rage, one has to look at a husband as a possible suspect. My mom was German. She uh, met my dad when he was in the army over in Germany. Between my mom and my dad, my dad was the quiet one. She was definitely the one who was outspoken, and she was the disciplinarian in the family. And um, she would, you know, put on her records. At that time, you know, they had those old stereos. <laughs> She'd dance and she'd want to dance with me. My, you know, my boyfriends who would come over, she would dance with them. She was a lot of fun. She was very outgoing in that way. I've lost count of the times I've seen something that looked so perfect turn ugly when you open closet doors. Could that be the case with Katerina and Charles? So what was Charles doing the morning his wife died? It was a typical morning for my mom and dad. My dad went to work about seven o'clock. Work for Charles is at a local steel mill. It's there that detectives discover something that spikes their attention. The murder weapon was um, actually made at a place where he worked. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. My father was a suspect. In a vicious attack, Katarina Brown, a popular middle-aged mother of two, has been murdered. About the only thing that seems clear is that the attack is personal and driven by rage. For a savage crime like this to happen in a small town like Ayer, Massachusetts is rare, which has everyone nervously asking who did it and why. It made people afraid. People, you know, when, when, when there is a murderer on the loose, it would make any community nervous when you don't know 
who the perpetrator is out there. And you don't know if you're going to be the next one. Her husband, Charles, is reportedly the last person known to have seen Katerina alive. What's your relationship to Katerina Brown? That's my wife. And there's strong evidence he had access to the weapon used to kill her. He worked for a knife company in air, and the knife was from the company that my dad worked for. Okay, you've got my attention. The husband actually works in the plant that makes the knives that killed his wife. It's not proof, but it's unsettling. Motive means an opportunity. Not sure about motive, but the last two are there for sure. Wait a minute. That knife doesn't tell you anything. Everyone in town owns a drawer full, including Charles and Katerina. They make them here. So before we crucify this guy for something he didn't do, can we please find out where Charles was when his wife was murdered? He said he was working at the time that she would have been murdered. But, you know, could he have left work and come back home? Or could anything else have, have happened? Did he just check in work and check out right away, sick or something like that? And can anyone verify this? Yes, my coworkers. Charles Brown? Police head to the knife factory to find out if he's telling the truth. Friends sometimes lie to cover for their pals. And with no time cards to back up his story, A or PD need to be sure. So Charles is subjected to a polygraph exam. They had a lie detector test. Charles, did you kill Katerina Brow? No. They gave Charles Brow a polygraph test and he passed it which con confirmed what he said to us. He was ruled out. After the incident, my dad, he had moments when he would just start crying. I'd never seen my dad cry before. He didn't want to move. He didn't want to go anywhere. He, he wanted to stay at the house. I could never stay in the house anymore after that. It's not just Charles Brow who is hit hard by this gruesome murder. It's the whole family. Very difficult for all of us. Very difficult, especially my sister-in-law. It's 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 kind of a kind of a blur. I mean, I know for for me, I, I just remember that uh, we needed to have somebody come in to clean because it was terrible. It was a mess. There was blood splatter all over the place. We couldn't get anybody to come in and clean the house, and my sister-in-law and I had to do it. That's what I remember. We had to do it. We had to clean the walls and... I could never stay there again. Investigators are back to square one. With no new suspects and no leads, the case stalls. And that means someone is getting away with murder. My mom is a good person, hard worker, kept to herself and had her friends that she would go visit down at the diner. She didn't deserve to die the way she did. As the next few weeks and then months pass and no new evidence emerges, for all involved, it's looking like the mystery of who killed Katarina Brown will never be solved. But then, a year and a half later, local bad boy Kenny Waters' girlfriend gives him the boot. Brenda Marsh claimed that she'd been physically abused by Waters and threatened with death and so forth. It was a very tough relationship. 
Officer Taylor. Brenda's mad, and as well as claiming she's been abused by Kenny, she drops a bombshell on Thank Ayers you. PD. Waters told her that this German woman had a lot of money, and um, quote unquote, he was going to get the money and kill that German. We learned from that first interview that Waters had gone to work that morning for the murder. And when she called to talk to him there, he wasn't there. When he came home, he also told her, if the police come, tell them I'm not here. What Brenda says next offers police the hard evidence they have been waiting for. When he came home, she noticed a scratch on him. Why is this a vital point? Well, the medical examiner's report says Katarina fought off her attacker with every last ounce of her strength. If Brenda is telling the truth and Water's face was scratched, he's not looking so innocent anymore. I mean, my mom, she definitely put up a fight. But, you know, this, you know, this person just, you know, overpowered her. I mean, my mom was 5'2", and she was recovering from a heart attack. What bolsters detective suspicions even more is Kenny's blood type. It's the same as they found at the crime scene. There was a crime scene search done at the home, of course. And blood was taken from the scene and analyzed. And they did find two types of blood. Then it was type A, which turned out to be Mrs. Browse. And it was type O, which uh, was the perpetrator's blood. Now, one suspect had the O type. And that was Kenny Waters. We need to take a breath here, for starters. Anything said by Kenny's ex, Brenda, has to be taken with a grain of salt. He was a rotten boyfriend. She's mad. It's malicious, but this just might be her way of getting even. It's happened before. We need to remember, though, Kenny's time card still proves he was at work, which means someone is lying. She was taken to the district attorney's office, and they asked Brenda Marsh to take a lie detector test. Do you intend to answer truthfully each question on this test? Yes. Did Kenny Waters tell you he killed Katharina Brown? Yes. Then she passed it, which confirmed what she said to us. lack is physical evidence that connects Kenny Waters to the murder. Initially, the crime scene was processed for fingerprints, and they found a fingerprint on a faucet, and they found a fingerprint in blood on a toaster that was obviously uh, involved in the struggle. Those are two really, really critical pieces of evidence. and they processed those fingerprints. And they were matching it against potential suspects. Uh, people in California, Kenny Waters, his brothers, uh, anybody that was a potential suspect in the case, they matched the fingerprints and then eliminated them. It is not Kenny Waters' fingerprint on the faucet. It is not Kenny Waters' fingerprint and blood on the toaster. It's not like in the movies and the TV shows that, oh, there's the prints, there's the blood. It doesn't work that way in real life. It just means his prints weren't found. It doesn't mean they weren't there. From the get-go, investigators had believed the motive was more than theft. This is personal. Now, they have a deep look into Kenny's past and discover Kenny and Katarina have history. As a kid, Kenny was a neighborhood menace. He regularly broke into people's houses. There was one year 
when our house was broken into and my brother and I, we had piggy banks, they were stolen. We found out that Kenny Waters had broken in and stolen our money. Caught red-handed with the items taken from the Brow House, the 10-year-old is taken away from his family and shipped off to Juvenile Hall. In Kenny's mind, he felt that it was my mom's fault was the reason why he went there. He always blamed Mrs. Brow for that and said that one day he would get even with her about that. When Brenda came out of the blue and said, Kenny did it, the cops were absolutely right in taking a second look at him. A burglary plan fueled by a decade-old grudge? That theory just doesn't make sense. We're looking at a rage killing here. Rage? Rage is Water's middle name. He stabbed a man half to death in a bar fight. He attacked a uniformed officer with a machete. Who knows what could set this guy off? The DA has more than enough to charge him and bring him before a jury to decide. The district attorney's office said, arrest Kenneth Waters. And so some officers went to Rhode Island where Waters was staying. Waters was just very violent type of criminal, and they found him hiding in a basement. Hands up, come here, turn around. Hurry up, turn around. Get against the wall. I'm arresting you, Kenneth Waters, for the murder of Katharina Brow. Kenny, Kenny Waters. Kenny, 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 Kenny. Under arrest for the brutal slaying of small town mom, Katharina Brow. Kenny Waters is thrown in jail. It was a brutal murder. I, I, I don't know how you stab somebody so many times. A or PD are determined to make Kenny pay for this crime. But they know they need more evidence so prosecutors have enough to build their case. And that's when a second of Kenny's ex-girlfriends comes forward to tell police a lurid tale. Rosanna Perry claimed that she lived with Waters for a while, suffered a lot of physical abuse from him, including threats of murder. Kenny did not have very good judgment in uh, his girlfriends. Roseanne tells the police officers, uh, oh, you know, he made an admission to me when we were out drinking one night that, uh, yes, I killed the German And of course, this was then used against him. Waters' trial for murdering Katarina Brown opens two years after her death, with her hometown praying justice will finally be served. How do you plead? Not guilty. This has all the hallmarks of a conviction of convenience. Somebody has to pay. Who better than the local bad boy? Kenny's time card from the diner gives him a solid alibi. Everything the prosecution has to offer is hearsay and supposition. I'm not so sure about that. When you put all the circumstances together, a history of hatred for the victim, the blood evidence at the crime scene, and now two women separately claiming he told them he did it, hard to get more damning than that. And that's not all the prosecution has against Kenny Waters. They say it's more than likely he knew Katarina kept money hidden in her home. He knew her through his job at the Park Street Diner. She would just go down there a lot. That's where her friends were, and she would have a cup of coffee, and that was her thing. I know my mom was planning on taking a trip to Germany. She, she was saving money for that. Maybe something was overheard. That's the location where Mrs. Brow said that she had a good deal of money at home. And Waters heard that. 
Katarina's cash is untraceable, but her missing jewelry isn't. And Kenny is said to have been trying to sell it. Hey, Eddie. Eddie, here. Yeah. After the, the murder, he was in possession of a piece of jewelry of Mrs. Brow's and um, offered to sell it to someone who turned out to be one of Mrs. Brow's uh, friends. Five dollars, yeah. Addie was one of my mom's best friends. And so she contacted the police and let them know about what he was trying to do. The case against Waters is solid, backed up by real witnesses. Justice for Katerina Bro is just a verdict away. As both sides prepare their closing arguments, things aren't looking good for Kenny Waters. But there's one person who is convinced of his innocence, Kenny's kid sister, Betty Ann. There's no question that uh, uh, Kenny and his uh, sister were very close when they were kids. Well, his sister, Betty Ann, seemed to have always been there for him. She sat through the trial, and she knew that he had to be innocent. From the start, Kenny's strongest line of defense has been his alibi. He was cooking breakfast orders at the diner when Katarina was murdered. His time cards can prove it, but they're not produced in court. Nobody knows where they are. But some see the woman who is leading the case against Kenny Waters as a controversial figure. This whole investigation was being led by Nancy Taylor, and uh, she had not even been uh, graduated from the police academy, and she was not really a police officer at the time that she was taking the lead in this homicide investigation. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I swear. Well, Nancy Taylor, she was a qualified rape investigator. So how she's not qualified to be an investigator, that's just a bold-faced lie. Nancy Taylor was an interesting figure. Half the police department despised her. They thought that she was sloppy with her investigating. There's a lot of complaints. After seven days in court, the jurors are sent out to deliberate. It takes them a little over five hours to decide Kenny's fate. Order, order. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, how do you find the defendant? And when it was done, the, the foreman of the jury came in with the jury and told the judge that they find the defendant, Kenneth Waters. Guilty, Your Honor. He was convicted and sentenced to life in jail. Kenny! Kenny! And I felt that, that justice was served. It was good that he was, he was gonna go to prison for life with no chance of parole. I felt that that was, that was the start, that was, and that was good. This isn't justice served, but a major injustice. Kenny's bad reputation and ex-girlfriends swayed the verdict. Proof of guilt had nothing to do with it. Kenny's great salvation was that he had this sister who saw her brother convicted for a crime she knew he didn't commit and pledged that she would get him out. <laughs> Kenny, Kenny. Don't touch him. And then just days after the conviction. Hello? Betty Ann Waters. Who is this? Gets telephoned by Kenny's uh, old girlfriend, Rosanna Perry, admitting uh, that she lied.
after going unsolved for two years, the mysterious murder of Katarina Brow is solved with the conviction of local bad boy, Kenny Waters. But not everyone is convinced of his guilt. Waters' sister, Betty Ann, publicly vows to clear his name, no matter how long and hard she has to work. Her first break comes with a phone call from Rosanna Perry, the second of the ex-girlfriends who testified against Kenny in court. Tell the lawyer exactly what you told me on the phone last night. Lawyers immediately got Roseanne Perry on tape, admitting that she lied and recanting her uh, statements. Kenny never told me he killed her. Rosanna Perry said, oh, I lied. I lied about this. I, I, I did that to Kenny Waters. I shouldn't have. In my opinion, the best testimony is the first testimony, usually, and rightfully so. But Rosanna recanting what she said in court isn't the magic ticket to freedom Betty Ann hopes it will be. Roseanne, she gave a statement that then in the final analysis, she flipped back, you know, supporting her original story uh, because uh, she was afraid of being prosecuted for perjury. When you walk through a prison, many a cell has a guy in it who will gladly tell you his tale about how he shouldn't be there. And the waiting rooms are full of people who believe them. I feel bad for Betty Ann. She believes her brother is innocent, but he was convicted by a jury that heard lots of evidence and had no reasonable doubts. One bit of testimony is not what put Waters behind bars. It was all of it considered together. This one flip-flopping witness is not enough to reopen the case. However, Betty Ann finds out there's another witness that may have been coerced, Kenny's other ex, Brenda. So how did he look when he came home, Brenda? I don't know, I don't remember. You don't remember? In the course of this interview, the police officer basically says, look, you can have your kid taken away from you, uh, uh, so tell us the truth, tell us what your boyfriend is saying, uh, uh, that you know who it is, and she makes up this story about Kenny Waters uh, that isn't true. Some people have said that uh, Brenda Mosh was uh, forced into testifying and, and making up this elaborate story. But there was no truth to these uh, wild allegations. He confessed to them that he did it. I mean, just that right there. I mean, it all can't be wrong. With Kenny's hope of an early release dashed, he remains locked away, where he spirals into despair. Kenny had the worst imprisonment. Temperamentally, psychologically, this is among the worst suffering of an inmate. I've seen Kenny tried to commit suicide quite a number of times. Kenny, I promise I'm going to get you out of here. After learning of Kenny's suicide attempts, Betty Ann renews her determination to get him out of prison. For her, it's now a matter of life and death. There you go. I mean, it's just the most unbelievable story. Here's this woman who is from a working class background. She had not even got a GED, but she was very smart, very idealistic. So she went back to college, and then she went to law school for one purpose and one purpose only, to prove her brother innocent. What can I get you? For years, Betty Ann campaigns to free her brother while attending college and law school and bartending at night to make ends meet. All this, plus raising her two boys as a single mom. She followed everything, every little police report. She knew every detail of the case. The more Betty Ann digs, the more she unearths. First off, 
there's that scratch that Brenda said Kenny had on his face. He had a long scratch down his face, from his eye to his chin. Brenda gives him this story, and of course the problem with this is that uh, the police themselves had uh, interviewed Kenny and looked at his body. Come away from the wall, take your shirt off. Right after the crime was committed, and there was no scratch reported. You know, I've never understood how this could have been forgotten by the air police. That's impossible. It would make one wonder how someone could get away from a scene like that without having any marks on them. I mean, one can get a scratch and it can be taken care of, you know, that you might not see it. And there was nothing in a polygraph that indicated she was lying about that. Betty Ann keeps on digging and uncovers more suspect evidence from the trial. There's this whole issue about a ring that uh, he must have stolen in the course of the robbery murder. Turns out, this key piece of evidence was never presented at the trial. Instead, jurors were given photos to look at. Uh, there's some doubt as to what ring was in question here. The ring in the photographs presented to the jury had initials in it, which were from another ring entirely. And how about Kenny's alibi? Kenny's time cards could have proved he was working at the time of the murder. So if the police had them, why weren't they shown at the trial? They could have swung the jury his way. Betty Ann Waters herself went and talked to the people to try to get those time cards. You know, I always wondered about that night. Kenny was working. Right. They have a time card. Do you still have them? No. We gave those to the police. Thanks. And all of a sudden, at the time of trial, uh, they're not around. No, like I said, we submitted everything that we have. This is as bad a frame job or stitch up as you'll find. Betty Ann and Kenny's lawyers try every which way to appeal the case, but each application is thrown out. This is just plain wrong. The state of Massachusetts has put its head in the sand. The glaring holes in this case are obvious, but the state is determined to ignore them. If Kenny was rich, if he had big time lawyers, he'd be a free man. But he's poor, he's uneducated. All he's got is the extraordinary commitment of his sister, Betty Ann, the smallest time lawyer of them all. She is an amazing woman, no doubt. And our legal system is designed to be challenged because at the end of the day, it's about justice for all. He just was just trouble. In prison, out of prison, I think there was probably up to 40 or 50 infractions that he committed while he was in prison. Sixteen years have passed since the trial ended, and Betty Ann's ambition to become a lawyer and free Kenny burns as fiercely as ever. One day, she takes a class in the brand new science of DNA testing. It's a eureka moment. Of course, there was blood found at the crime scene. So Betty Ann read about DNA testing and decided to try to find somebody who could do those tests in order to prove her brother innocent. Betty Ann reaches out to a group dedicated to overturning miscarriages of justice, the Innocence Project. Hello, Barry Sheck. Run by lawyer Barry Sheck. She knew that we had been using DNA testing to demonstrate that people were wrongly convicted, understood immediately that uh, she had to get the blood evidence in this case. The blood samples, even if they still exist, are 18 years old. The stakes couldn't be higher. Betty Ann and her law school 
classmate went to find the blood evidence. That's 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. Try down the court house. She was told over and over again that that stuff was destroyed. Hi, I'm looking for the files for Kenneth Waters. But it turned out to be in a box at the courthouse. Eddie Ann made sure that that box couldn't be opened by anybody, wrote their names on it, had it taped up, uh, so we could eventually have the DNA testing done. Finally, what this case has needed all along is some actual facts, real, true, verifiable information. DNA testing is definitely bringing hard science to the process of identification. And now that it's available, it should be used to resolve cases of doubt just like this. But more often than not, it confirms the other evidence. So the question is, what will it do for Kenny Waters? Everything rides on this one test. For the victim's family, the pain of a possible retrial. For Betty Ann, her faith in her brother. And for Kenny, his freedom. In a last roll of the dice, 18-year-old blood evidence from the Katerina Brow crime scene is tested. Finally, DNA can answer the question, did Kenny Waters murder Katerina Brow? Eventually, the DNA test results came back to one male, uh, and that male was not Kenny Waters. Thank you. He was totally innocent. Kenny Waters spent nearly 20 years behind bars, and the real killer of an innocent woman went free. That's the real cost of wrongful conviction. Justice is not done, and the real criminals continue to prey on the innocent. Thank God for Betty Ann. Without her and the allies she recruited, we might never have known that the search for Katerina Brow's killer had to go on. But as definitive as the DNA science is, there are some who just can't accept it. It's clear from any logical examination of the evidence that there were two, at least two suspects in the murder. She had trauma injuries from a, a lamp and many stab wounds, and it would take two people to uh, accomplish that at the same time. And the fact that there is blood there that was not Waters' blood would indicate that was the second suspect's blood at the scene. Air police are convinced that Katerina Brow was murdered by two people. It's a theory that is hotly contested by Kenny's defense team. There's no evidence that there was more than one person who was involved in committing this crime. And there is no physical evidence that in any way ties Kenny Waters to this scene. Okay, if you two beat me up now, and, and I died, and they didn't find your blood, but they found his, doesn't mean you weren't there. Still, the district attorney didn't want to let him go. She wanted more than the DNA tests. Oh, it's not Kenny Waters' blood, so therefore that means that he didn't do it and he, that he's innocent. How is that possible? It's not his blood. Well, he wasn't convicted on blood evidence because we didn't have DNA then. The jury had convicted Waters on testimony. I accept that the blood wasn't Waters. It is a huge new piece of evidence that just may overturn his guilt. But there are questions now to ask. Could more than one person have committed this crime? Before we turn Kenny Waters loose, we need to revisit the witnesses who say that he confessed. The district attorney wanted the people who said that Kenny confessed to recant. Barry Sheck and Betty Ann tracked down the woman whose sworn testimony condemned her ex-boyfriend to a lifetime behind bars. Hello, Brenda. Remember me? 
Betty Ann and I went and we interviewed Brenda Marsh. She was obviously quite beaten down by life and sorry about it all. Uh, it's a lot to live with. I wasn't telling the truth. What I said in court, it wasn't true. Brenda admitted that she was being pressured to make these statements and they were not true, so she recanted. We had the DNA, we had Brenda Marsh's recantation. We provided that to the district attorney's office. And the next thing you know, Kenny gets out of prison. Eighteen years after he was thrown in a prison cell for a crime he didn't commit, Kenny Waters walks out a free man. Kenny! At last, Kenny has his freedom. But for Katarina's family, this is no happy ending. I felt like, you know, my time with my mom was definitely cut short. I miss my mom a lot. In a final tragic turn in this twisting murder story, Kenny Waters only gets to enjoy six months on the outside. In what was really just a freak accident, he fell off a wall taking a shortcut home, fractured his skull, and died of head injuries. Both families are victims here, and my heart goes out to them. A man was locked up for a crime he didn't commit, and a family was denied the justice they deserve. Darren is right. The justice system doesn't get it wrong very often, but when we do, the effects are truly far-reaching. You don't just destroy the life of the person wrongly convicted. It reopens the wounds for the victim's family. It erodes public confidence in our system of justice, and it means someone is out there getting away with murder. One day we'll be able to identify and apprehend that individual with luck, but it'll take a lot of luck. I always imagine how things could be if, if you know, she was still here with me. Mom? I think about it all the time, all the time. I think about her and, and what was.